Hi, I'm Kelly Thomas. Welcome to Ingenious Baby. Every week I'll interview leading experts to help you help your child reach their full potential so that your child can become all that they were born to be. Welcome to this baby. Joining us today is Dr. Frank Lawless, Supervising Testing Director for American Mensa. He'll tell us the signs your child could be gifted and give us tips to help cultivate genius in your own child. So Dr. Lawless, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you for asking me. Uh, this is one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> what percentage is IQ? I mean, how much is stimulation and how much is genetic? Well, um, in the field, we usually say it's a 50-50 deal. Hmm. Um, it's very, it's kind of like, uh, if you don't have the capacity to run a 100-yard dash in 10 seconds, uh, regardless of how often you are motivated and how much you are trained, you probably will never, ever uh, reach that point, although there's obviously exceptions. For example, I, I'm kind of edging myself out on a limb here, but as I recall, uh, Mozart was... Uh, not was kind of one of those uh, kids that came out of a very low IQ functioning family. But he, he rose through that, uh, that issue uh, and became what I call a genius. I think you could say the same thing for almost any of the uh, geniuses that, uh, that we know about is they, they didn't come necessarily from parents that were high IQ. So it was all about their environment and stimulation. Yes, exactly. Can so, anyone raise their IQ to a genius level or a Mensa level? Is anyone capable of doing that? Absolutely, absolutely. One of the, uh, and if I can kind of uh, show you a, a book that I wrote, uh, which had to do with the IQ answer. Mm -hmm. And in these particular uh, exercises, mm -hmm. I demonstrate that uh, you can raise your IQ IQ significantly by 10 or 20 or even 30 points uh, by using some of these exercises. For example, if you don't breathe correctly, in other words, uh, most people who take tests tend to hold their breath when they get anxious. Mm -hmm. So when that happens, you cut off oxygen to your brain. So uh, I teach people how to breathe and and uh, in, increase the oxygen level to their uh, in their brain and consequently make them make them smarter or make them perform higher on their IQ test. Another way of dealing with um, uh, upping the their IQ is I teach them what to eat. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, uh, eating boiled eggs will increase a person's IQ by 10 or 20 points. Uh, also, uh, because uh, boiled eggs have high level of choline, and that mm -hmm. will help the brain. There's another trick is have uh, your children chew gum. Chewing gum actually creates uh, an increased flow from uh, blood into your brain, which then makes it um, more capable of dealing with uh, high, higher intellectual capacity. Uh, and all these have been shown um, in research to en enhance IQ significantly. So I want to hear the breathing exercise. What, how, tell us what, how you need to breathe. Is there a tip or a specific something that you can do? Show us. Well, actually, I've done a lot of study with regard to breathing patterns. And uh, I, I'll show you a couple that really make a big difference in terms of IQ and, and intellectual functioning. One is basically to breathe regularly, uh, not, not uh, hyperventilate, but basically to increase the blood, uh, the breathing air all the way down into the lower lung, uh, lobes of your lungs mm -hmm. and, and kind of generate a, a higher uh, flow of air through your body. That will increase the oxygen level in your brain. What another uh, form of breathing, and this may kind of turn people off, but it, it is a, 
a fact that you can increase your creativity by what's called alternate nostril breathing. And that is that you breathe one nostril and then the other nostril and then the other nostril. So you alternate your nostril one full cycle of exhalation and inhalation and that will actually create more activity on both sides of your brain so that it helps to integrate thought patterns and make you more creative. Interesting. And then going to the food, you mentioned the boiled eggs. Do you mean having them soft boiled? Like they read that you want them to be soft because the yolk when it's running is more healthy? You want to create at least the amount of heat that you can in order to cook the eggs. If you just give them to a person raw, there's a lot of health issues that has to do with parasites and other bacteria. So you want to kill all that. And the easiest way to do that is to boil them. On the other hand, don't create higher temperature because that will change the molecular structure of the egg. And so you're no longer eating eggs, you're eating something else. And that's not nearly as helpful in terms of the brain function. In your book you mentioned music. What about music? How does that impact intellectual development? Well, there's certain frequencies of your brain. We call them beta, high beta, beta, alpha, theta, and delta. Basically, those are the ranges of how your brain works at their frequency. So what you want to do is you want to listen to music that stimulates the beta, the high level of functioning. You don't want to go too high and make you too anxious. We go again into issues of anxiety. So you want to have what we call a 60 count, which is basically like a 4-4 time in music. If you listen to that, that you will basically not only increase intellectual capacity, but you'll also prevent depressive bouts. We have, in my clinic, we have a CD that we use for exactly this reason. And we have the children listen to this when they're doing their homework and so forth, so that it helps them concentrate as well as feeling more positive. What kind of music? Is it any music? I mean, can you name some of the examples of the kind of music you were talking about? Classical music tends to have that effect more easily. And there's also kind of, there's been some good effects of spiritual music like gospel and some rock and roll. What doesn't seem to work very well because of the extreme impact is hard, what is it, hard metal. Oh, yeah. And I hate to say this because I'm kind of a country and western fan myself, but some of the country and western songs are so sad that it slows you down. I can see. If you listen to how bad your woman treated you or being on trains or having drugs or something like that, that doesn't seem to help you very much intellectually. Right. Let me also talk about this research that's called Secrets of Champions. And what they did was, now these weren't with kids, these were with adults, basically military people and athletes. And they took the top 1% of their abilities to perform, and they found that the top 1% basically operated in what we call a parasympathetic mode. In other words, you have a sympathetic system that is arousal, that's when you get excited and you're afraid and you have to run away from tigers and so forth. So your body operates in kind of a panic level. 
but that's a high level. And then you have parasympathetic, which is more your relaxation and your restorative phase. So what they found with these champions is that they operated 80% in the parasympathetic and 20% in the sympathetic. So what they were doing basically is operating at this high level in a relaxed way. In other words, they weren't anxious, they were comfortable, and they were breathing correctly at the same time. So there's kind of a combination that really works very well. And I think that a lot of people learn these things in a variety of ways, and that's what makes them so smart. When would be the most important time to introduce your child to different experiences and things like that? What we know, especially through the development, is that your highest level of learning and the ways of learning, it's actually before the age of six. But at the age of five to seven, I begin to get a lot of languaging that's coming in. And so what you see is this huge amount of intellectual capacity growing and growing and growing until they get adolescent. And then when they get at that adolescent stage, then things tend to get very disruptive. So, and in fact, a lot of children that I would consider to be high IQ lose their IQ benefits when they get into adolescence because of the hormonal dysfunction and the other social issues that play out one's interest. Oh, interesting. Is there anything in particular for the younger age group that you would recommend to help boost their IQ and potential? Well, like I said, I think that stimulation is a big, big part of it. I think reading to children, like teaching them how to read from the very beginning as soon as they can. I wouldn't force them, but I would certainly give whatever offering that I could when they were ready so that they can get excited and interested in performing intellectual ways. And also in terms of teaching them the meaning of word, this can be very helpful just in conversation. We know, for example, that the more you talk to a kid, the smarter he's going to get. Where can people find more information in their local communities about what Mensa has to offer? I think Mensa offers a lot of opportunities for somebody that's smart, especially smarter than the average bear, to find relationships and to give reinforcement. And of course, you have other opportunities such as getting some foundations to support you. Being a member of Mensa offers you a lot more opportunity for people to give you scholarships and help you along the way in terms of college and other kinds of learning opportunities. Well, you provided some really valuable information today, and I really appreciate you coming on the show and giving us your tips and helping people achieve their potential. Thank you. Thank you. If you know someone who would be a great fit for the show, come on over to ingeniousbaby.com and share your tips and story ideas. You are your baby's first and best teacher.